Praise the Lord. I'm so glad to have another opportunity um, to share the laws of faith with you. Um, I thank you also for uh, the outpouring of support and uh, confidence and appreciation for what uh, God has placed on my heart for you and I to share uh, concerning faith. Um, you know, I say all the time that uh, when we got saved, um, I don't know about you in your context, but I was simply told to have faith. Uh, I wasn't taught what it was. I, you know, I started to believe that perhaps it was something that you just picked up automatically. You know, you, I'm saved now and you're going to have faith. Um, uh, and it's true, God gives us faith, but learning how to operate in faith is an extraordinarily different thing than just knowing you have it. Uh, because I immediately, as I got saved, I immediately began to have challenges and um, didn't know I was to react with faith. Uh, and the strength of my faith would be based on the strength of my relationship with God. So, I, you know, I'm operating as a new child of God and they're telling me to walk in faith. And I have no reason to, to know. I have no way to know what that's like. So I spend a lot of time in ministry trying to share uh, with God's people exactly what a walk of faith looks like. Now, I'm going to give you a little assignment and you can begin uh, to do this. And then I want you to write me on this site and let me know uh, how this one simple assignment, before I start teaching you on the first law of faith in this section, this one little assignment will begin to revolutionize the way you live out your faith. Because the Bible tells us, watch this, this is another one they threw at me when I first got saved, the just shall live by faith. Okay. So I need to understand what it's like to live the life of faith. And I need to understand what the challenges are to faith. And I need to understand, you know, how do I recover in faith when at times doubt and even fear um, can challenge who I am in God? So faith uh, is a part of the identity that God gives us. It says, the Bible says, without, in Hebrews 11, I believe, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So that let me know early on that this thing called faith uh, is not something I can go to the religious section at the nearest department store and just buy it. I've got to know how to live this life of faith because the just or the righteous live by faith. And without this faith thing, it's impossible to please God. So um, it has been part of my mission you know, for myself and for you uh, that you know how to live in faith that works and, and how to challenge the doubts uh, and the tests in your life. So what I want to talk to you about is going to be found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. And just so you can remember this lesson, I'm going to talk about the dilemma of faith, the dilemma of faith. Um, uh, real important, especially in this time that we live now, um, you got to understand a few things about it. Now, let's go to Hebrews 1035 and we'll start there and then we'll keep having our conversation. Simply says, 1035 says, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. The first thing I need to clear up for you is there was a very natural um, expectation that this confidence and faith mean the same thing. That's the first thing I want to get off the table, on the table, uh, and then throw it under the table. Because I believe first time I saw cast not away your confidence, I thought that they were talking about don't throw away your faith. So... I don't know how it is in your life, but in my life, when I'm talking, when I'm studying my word, you know, the Holy Ghost will tell me, look this word up. And I, you know, I have a discussion with the Holy Ghost. I don't want to call it an argument, but I'll, I'll, I'll say, well, Lord, I know what that means. And he'll say, look it up. And then I'll say, I really do know what that means. Dave, I need you to look it up. And invariably, it means something totally different. God means something different by the word than what I mean. And if I'm going to walk in the power of a word, if the word of God is going to shift from logos to rhema, I've got to know what God means, not just what I want it to mean or what I think it means. So I looked up confidence and lo and behold, of course, the Lord was right. 
It means don't throw away speaking those words of faith. Don't go from a prayer of, of faith and a prayer of expectation to a prayer of doubt and a prayer of poor me. Because what I'm doing when I change the way I speak based on my situation, I'm either holding on to my faith if I keep words in positive, optimistic expectation, words of faith in the Bible, or I throw away my confidence by speaking words of doubt, words of fear, uh, words of worry, words of sorrow. So I've got to have an unwavering confidence, which means my language has to stay the same despite the situation I find myself in. I know this is helping you already because isn't it easy right now? especially in the environment that we're in with this pandemic all over, which the Bible calls a plague all over the world. Isn't it easy to adopt the language of the news you're watching continually rather than, watch this, allow, allowing the word of God to become dominant. We unbalance our faith with doubt by listening to the news so much that it becomes, starts to become gospel to us. And based upon, watch this, what the news is saying, my feelings start to be impacted. And all of a sudden, subtle words of doubt creep up in my spirit. Now, watch what I said. It is not so much that you are articulating your questions and your doubt. You start feeling things differently that are not attached to faith. So, you know, things in your, in your heart, unspoken. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm worried about my future. Uh, you know, those kinds of uh, confident words that prove that you've placed your confidence in what you believe. In other words, change your dialogue. Change how you articulate. Change what you say. Watch this to yourself and perhaps to others based on what you're going through. Because the enemy wants to use your doubt to disconnect you from the reward God has for you. And it's not just a, a, a recompense, but a great recompense, a, a, a recompensation, if I can use a play on words. God coming around and making up the difference for what you think you may have missed. So my confidence can't waver if I keep my relationship with God consistent and strong. If I continue to walk in purpose, if I hold on to hope, and everything that implies an act of faith, speaking what I believe confidently and boldly, removing the fear and the anxiety that some other people of God are experiencing right now. And, and believe me, uh, you're falling for one of the greatest marketing ploys I've ever seen. All they do is say it's breaking news at eight o'clock and you believe something else new is going to happen. And you find yourself spending another 60 minutes watching the same story in a different hour. And they get you to the next hour and say, breaking news at nine. You end up watching the same thing because you're waiting for them to say something different when they say the same thing every hour of the day. And because of that inundation, if I can use that word, because of the saturation that we receive, that word that we're receiving from the news starts to impact our thinking and our hearts. That produces what I call a baby called doubt. And when doubt matures, it becomes fear. Listen to what I said. Doubt is the baby. Fear is the grown up. So the fear that you have begins with doubt. And the ultimate purpose of the enemy is to get you walking more in fear than you are in faith. Talking to you about the laws of faith, talking about the dilemma of faith. So how is it mm -hmm, that I can be a person of faith but still have so much fear and doubt operating in my life? Now, I want to share a principle with you that's not even in the lesson today um, that's going to make so much sense. It's almost insane. Watch this. Why is it, I'll use me as an example, why is it that my faith is always weakest in the areas that I seem to need faith the most? Why is it that my faith seems to be the most challenged, the weakest? Where's my doubt in areas of my greatest need? 
It's almost consistent. I can believe God, and watch this, I can believe God for you for something that I'm not going through and have strong faith for you. Same problem hits me, I have trouble with my faith. So all of a sudden now, one of the dilemmas of faith is I believe more for you than I do for myself, which is just, isn't that mind blowing? Um, and I, and I, not only do I believe more for you than I believe for myself, but the air of my greatest need is often the air of my weakest faith. Watch this. And when my faith is weak, it's usually attached or partnered with a level of disobedience. So all of us, most of us have faith in the principle of praise, worship, some faith and some doubt in the power of prayer. Now, I'm not talking about what we say. I'm talking about what we feel. Because when the Bible says all things are possible, if you believe, it presents a dilemma for many of us. Because if I believe, why aren't all things possible? Here's a key. The dimension of what I want to receive, if I can use these words, has to be matched by your dimension of faith. The dimension of the, of the answer has to be equally yoked with the dimension of my belief. So if my, if my faith is not occupying a realm that takes hold of what I'm asking God for and I'm doubting or intimidated by what I'm praying for, it's fair to say my faith can't apprehend it. So my dim the dimension of my requests can only be facilitated by the appropriate dimension of my faith. Now, this is not even in a lesson. Uh, we, we, may, we, we may end up right here. Now, that you know the prayer of faith talks about uh, faith the size of a mustard seed and a mountain that has to be moved. I need you to hear me real clearly. Most of us see that scripture and translate it immediately that faith is so small compared to the mountain that's so large. Which gives the impression, if I don't understand what Jesus is trying to teach, is that I've got this little bit of faith against this huge obstacle called the mountain. We start to compare the sizes of the mountain and the size of the faith. Because the mustard seed is something you can actually lose in your hand. It's so small. But this mountain, I'm looking at it, and it looks so powerful. Watch us flip this on, our, on its head. Was Jesus actually teaching that faith is so small compared to the mountain? Or was Jesus teaching that faith is so powerful that all you need is a mustard seed size to move the, the, the mountainous article? Was he saying to us, no, don't look at the smallness of the faith. Look at the faith as that being enough. Watch this. To move that thing that's larger than what you think can be moved by anything else. Watch well, the second thing. So not only is he telling us, but then he's telling us that we have to be managers of the power of our faith. Because without being able to properly negotiate your own faith, you'll move the mountain and create a valley at the same time if you don't know how to appropriately apply your faith. I hope I'm helping you. So watch this. So what are you telling us, Bishop? I'm telling you that Jesus is not teaching you that your faith is so small that it needs to be intimidated by the obstacle you need to move, whether it's sickness, whether it's cancer, whether it's a family situation, whether it's the enemy himself. But what Jesus is trying to tell you is that you need to know how to handle this thing that's so powerful that this is all you're going to need to move that thing that seems so great. Somebody's shouting in their living room. The dilemma of faith. So the dilemma of faith oftentimes uh, causes a misunderstanding. We don't know how to navigate faith. I've only got a minute or two. Let me help you with this. So Hebrews 10, 19. Let's go there for a second. I want to show you something. And then uh, we'll end this particular conversation. We'll pick it up uh, the next time. Hebrews 10, 19. And it says here clearly, Having therefore, brethren, 
boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest, holiest by the blood of Jesus. Having therefore boldness. Now to get in, to, to move in boldness, I have to get rid of guilt. I'm writing this song right now, which uh, talks about that at the doorway of the presence of God, that I've got to lose my shame because shame's not allowed. Why? Because I'm guilty for what I do, but I'm ashamed of who I am. So shame, which was not created by God, can't come into the presence of God. So I've got to lose my shame. That's why he saves us. I've got to re-identify myself in, in the Lord so I have this new identity. Well, really, it's my, my original identity. So I can come boldly in and get forgiveness, uh, get relieved of my guilt. Some people say the guilt's not allowed, but I have to drop shame at the door and just take my guilt in and hand it to God. And how do I hand it? I confess to him. I say what he says. I have a conversation with him. But also, I have to know how to, I have to God has a way he wants to be approached. Uh, my brother, my sister, God, God, that protocol, boldness does not eliminate protocol. Boldness includes not just speaking to him, but knowing how to speak to him. Now, some of you are saying, well, you know, if he's God, I should be able to say whatever I want to say. You don't like people to talk to you any kind of way. So don't expect a holy God just, you know, just because he says come boldly, it means come boldly and correctly. You just can't approach me any kind of way. You just, I'm, I don't do that to people. I don't expect them to do it to me. So in the context of your relationship with God, relationship with God, you have to be a good steward of how you approach him. Choose your words like you want him to choose his with you. Watch where it goes now. That I've got to go to him in prayer with undoubting confidence, saying the things I need to say. So there's a reward attached to this confidence. Along with confidence, look at, look at verse 30. Uh, let's see where we're going here. 10, 19. Let's go to... Um, See what else I can show you here real quick. Go, go, to, go to 36, uh, 1036. For we have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. You have need of patience after you've done the will of God. So in my life and maybe in yours, my more patience is needed. My patience is needed. My endurance is needed after I've done the will of God. So in other words, while I'm waiting for the reward that comes with obeying God, I need patience because it does not come on the schedule that I would prefer. All right, let's keep moving now. 37, watch what it says. For yet a little while that he shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Watch this. He is coming in season, on time. Wait on the Lord. He is coming. My language can't change while I'm waiting. This is making perfect sense now. Let's go to 38, see what it says. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall, not have, shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving or the delivering of the soul. Faith will always commit to his way. So what I've taught you, kingdom, that another one of those words, buzzword in the kingdom. Kingdom means seeing it the way God sees it. Doing it the way God would do it, and we're going to add one more on today, speaking it the way God would say. So seeing it the way God sees it, doing it the way God does it, saying it the way God would say it. I just helped you. That's kingdom. So my perspective is kingdom. My doing is kingdom. My speaking is kingdom. Bible says, don't you dare draw back. 
Because if I draw back, the Lord can't get pleasure out of my life. I'm telling you, don't back up now. You're coming into a season of opportunity. I've taught you this. When you're, when you're, when the laws of faith require that you see every season as a season of opportunity and responsibility. You cannot maximize a season without accepting the responsibility in the season. And there's another whole laws of faith I'm going to talk to you about in a few minutes in another tape about this responsibility piece. So every season is presented first by an opportunity. You need to hear what I just said. Every season is introduced to you by an opportunity. Man by the pool has an opportunity to step into another season. That opportunity is presented to him when Jesus comes to the pool. The woman uh, with the barrel of meal and the oil. She's given an opportunity to, to, watch this, to produce another season in her life. David comes to the battlefield. Goliath is selling tickets. The whole nation backs up. But David, you know, steps in by faith. And it opens a whole nother season to him. Watch this. It complements the season he's anointed to receive in the future. Because he's already anointed to be king. Now the whole nation sees him defeat. Watch this. He's a candidate for Saul's seat. But he's in the already done the not yet. He's dwelling between times. So he comes down to the battlefield, read your Bible tonight and see the story, and he's not yet king, but he's come down to defend the king whose seat he's already been given by God. This is amazing. So the king is being defended by the not yet king. The reason God puts him in that position because the seat Saul is holding, God has already given to David. But the giant has to be killed before David can take over the seat. I wish I had more time. So the opportunity, watch this. His brothers, Saul and everybody were there at the battlefield. They did not fight the giant, which was the invitation to a new season in David's life. Because he needed the support of the army to reign well as a king. You need to hear what I'm saying. So watch what happens. So, so now, you know, we've heard this word today. We're talking about faith. And now God is presenting an opportunity for you and I to sow a seed. Seed is the way you open yourself up to another season. Seed has to have a name. Seed has to be uh, something that you want God to accomplish that's beyond your human means. But when I sow a seed, I'm enlisting the supernatural assistance of God. So right now, when the act of faith, when the opportunity is being presented to us, three voices pop up in our head. Voice of greed, voice of need, and the voice of our seed. Greed, that thing that the enemy partners with to keep us from doing what God has told us to do. Greed produces doubt. Greed produces fear. I become afraid of the unseen God in the sense that I become unsure of what he's going to do, but I'm sure of what I have right here. I learned a long time ago, the seed that leaves your hand will never leave your life because it's a spiritual and a natural thing. So the seed is natural and tangible in your hand, but I'm doing something supernatural with it. I want you to think of Jesus on the cross as the seed of God. Crucified, buried, but then God raises him from the dead to produce the Christ, the one that redeems us, the one that saves us. So the seed is both physical and supernatural at the same time. I hope you caught that. So you got to deal, you got to learn how to deal with and navigate the voice of your greed. Then you have to vo navigate the voice of your need because the voice of your need will also Keep you from sewing. I got to buy lunch. I got to get my hair done. I got my nails done. I got to buy a new pair of shoes. Got to take my shoes to the shop. I got to put a new tire on my bike. You know, all kind of need will pop up in your head when it's time to exercise faith. But we know the just live by faith. And I can't throw away my confidence by beginning to say those words that produce doubt. But my need is what moves the heart of God. 
So the voice of my greed rejects God. The voice of my need opens the heart of God. But only the voice of your seed opens the hand of God. So what I want you to do right now is understand that seed defies conditions. Seed stops the devil in his tracks because seed re rebukes the devourer and seed activates the power of God. So if I open, I open his heart with my need, I move his hand with my seed. Go to the icon. Sow that seed with us today. And watch God move in your life. I don't know what he's laying on your heart. What he's laying on my heart today is, is a $50 seed. I love that five number, grace, favor. I love that zero, eternity. Um, I, 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 today is the day that you begin to break through and understand that every seed you sow is attached to an opportunity and every opportunity is attached to another season. Seasons are times that God gives opportunity and responsibility. Won't you sow today, and I'm so glad you joined me for this Law of Faith. I'll see you next time.